I'm continuing with the topic on buying and selling of grace. And I promised you all that I'm not going to go through a lot of verses, like in the beginning, so that we can slowly journey and all of us grasp and understand together exactly what grace is and what God says what he wants to do with grace and so I'm, I'm not sure I, I want to google a word quickly because while my wife was talking a thought came up and that usually happens when she talks but micro is more something that that's small now what's the opposite of micro I thought that and I thought macro but you get a macro lens that you zoom in close to a, to a certain thing yeah so that's why but if micro is small, then macro is big. Okay. So, good. Thank you, Smiley. So, with, with this topic of grace, there's a micro focus and then there's a macro focus. So, God's focus on grace is macro. It's the bigger picture. It's the eternal picture. It's to do with the will of God and serving the purpose of God that is to do with eternity. Where we bring it I'm making examples and narrowing it down to the macro, where it's specifically targeted to our individual lives and what we encounter and what we go through. But just bear in mind or ever t keep the thought that God is talking in this in a macro context. So this is actually, to put it simply, is that God is telling us what He wants to do with the church purposefully. So if you adhere to this word, you are actually adhering to the will of God. If you put in practice this word, you are putting in, you are trying, you are in pursuit of the will of God. And so if you're looking, if you're saying that, I want to pursue the will of God, as he, as he varies us, this is the will of God. This is the macro perspective of the will of God. But there's something I wrote last that I want to, that I want to read out for you. I'm just looking for that. Okay, I'll go to that later. But yeah, let me start. So, this is the season where all prophetic words will come to be fulfilled. You see, another example of God talking macro. And as it comes to pass, it's no longer a prophetic word, but we are now loving it. So let's say, for example, Jelikom was said that I'm, making, I'm talking too much about myself. So I, would everybody permit me to use you guys for examples? Jelly's request. So I can use you guys as examples. Ne, Jelly? And I can use you as well. <laughs> Not you. <laughs> okay. So let, let me make an example. Okay, let me... I'll make an example of myself first and then I'll continue onwards with you guys. Is that Kubus prophet came and spoke, spoke a prophetic word towards my wife and I. That was 2018. And so today we are partially walking in that prophetic word. So that was a prophetic word that was spoken. And now in this prophetic word it has come to pass partially not fully and so we are not no we are no longer there's no longer prophetic word in the in the in, in the part where we're walking in now it's no longer prophetic word but we are living in it so that's the same manner in that in terms of grace that it's a promise god is giving out promises he's speaking about inheritance last week i mentioned about what an executor is of an estate that a saint one example like paul he is almost like an executor to your estate, to your inheritance. And so, those are promises that God gave to you. Those are things that God gave to you in the Spirit. So, it, 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 you are determining if you are loving and accessing this prophetic word, or will it still stay as a prophetic word? Okay. Yeah. Don't mind, uh, she's still in shit. they're moving around. Just focus here, focus here. <coughs> yeah. 
Don't worry, they, they can walk around, it's fine. So, JP started speaking about grace last in November 2019. We are now in 2021. Which is, which, what, what is that saying to us? It's saying that this word, a lot of this word has not come to pass yet. A lot of this word we are not living out yet. We are not putting it in practice yet. Meaning that if God gave promises like what, like in Abram, God gave promises to Abram. And it's by through grace that these promises are activated in our lives. So, which means that if we're not living out the prophetic word that God gave to us, then we are deficient in grace because we need grace to activate or access those prophetic words, the things that, that were spoken unto us. And when I'm saying prophetic word, I'm not just saying that when a prophet came to the town or to your house or to your church where he spoke a prophetic word, I'm saying that when somebody teaches the word, the word is full of prophecy. When Jesus said, you have an inheritance in Christ, that's a, that's a prophecy right there. Do you have it now? Are you living in it now? No. And did Jesus speak it? Yes. So it's a prophecy that must come to fulfillment. But how? You need grace to fulfill that prophecy. And the reason why it's like that, it's because God is the one that inspired Jesus to speak the things which God wanted to say. Remember, God is spirit, so he's not, he, 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 has no, not he has no access, but he does not have a human body. But he has access to people, to sons, which he speaks through. So if God is spirit and he wants to say something to the church, to the sons, to, the, to his people, then he uses people to speak through. But that which he requests from you, from you, he also empowers you to do through his grace. You see? So therefore, if he says, I have an inheritance for you, I have an estate for you, and for you to have access to this estate, you need grace. So did God give us the grace to have access to our, to our inheritance? Yes. So do we have the grace? Yes and no. We partially have it. Because remember in 2 Corinthians 9, it says this, that all grace may abound unto you, may abound unto you, sufficient unto all things. And then there's other scriptures in the Romans that says the manifold graces, meaning there's many graces. So we do have Christ and we are accessing Christ in certain spheres, but the grace that you need to fulfill the will of God is accessed through a saint one. And I don't want to jump around, but I feel it's okay because we, we're having a conversation here. So I want to read one scripture that was just so enlightening to me. It's almost like my wife said, you're reading it for the first time. I didn't know that scripture was there. Revelations 3 verse 14. Yeah. And it says, now remember in this, in this story, now, not in the story, in, in, in this chapter, it was by the end of the times where John was, I think he was blind or something, and he was like in a, desolate place somewhere in, I don't know where it was, but that's where God now spoke to him in the end and God was telling him what to write. And in this context of scripture, he's saying that um, John was writing unto the angels, to the angels, so he's writing to the angels of the churches. And angels, meaning in Greek, angelos, which refers to a sent one, those that are sent to the church, Somebody that has an elder or father is sent to a church that preaches the word to the church. So in this context, so let's say in, this, in the scripture that says, Ephesians 3, that says the dispensation of the grace of God given to Paul for the, the Gentiles or for whoever. So in that context, so let's say Paul is a sent one and John wrote these epistles. The, the epistles is most, it's, it's the word. But in those times, they call it epistles. It was written on certain pieces of paper and later constructed together into the Bible and different chapters. But when John wrote these epistles to the churches, he was telling them something, that the Lord 
told him to tell to the churches. And this is what I'm going to read now to you. So he says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, he writes, These things said, these things said the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold or hot. I would you, I would that you be, I would, it, I would you were cold or hot, yeah, whatever he says there. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will, spoo you, I will spit you out, out of my mouth because you say I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing and knows that, that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel you. So this is Jesus saying, I'm advising you. I'm trying to persuade you. I'm trying to bring understanding to you. I am counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that you may be rich and white in raiment, that you may be clothed, and that your shame of your nakedness do not appear and anoint you, and anoint your, your eyes with eye salve that you may see. So in the last verse, it, in the last context of the verse, it's just talking about faith. Faith is more sight. So, so what's, what's interesting, what, what John is writing there, is that this is just affirming and confirming that, that the Lord is using this method of somebody preaching the word to you so that one thing can be spoken to the church and not, let's say God, is, God shares with Mona, shares with my wife, shares with Caitlin, Smiley and, and Raymond and God shares a different thing and we do whatever each one says we must do because God is most sharing to everybody. Will the church now come to oneness? Will the church be able to accomplish the will of God? Because everybody is going in a different direction. You see? So, in terms of grace, God speaks to the saints a certain measure. But then God speaks to a saint one a certain measure. So, what God speaks to a saint one is different from what God speaks to a saint. So, in this context with John, he says, it says, Jesus is giving a message unto the churches. And he's telling them about the riches that they, that they think that, let's say for instance, like for us, us living in this house, let, if we bought a new car, whatever, or the business is prospering, we would measure that and say, yo, the grace is working in their life. But what you must measure by is the heart. Because if we are increasing in substance, but we don't transform in our hearts in the way we are. No humility, no compassion, no love, pride is there. Then that's not grace at work. That's just simply hard work and being rewarded for it. That's like a world, that is the world system. So then we are thriving in the world's economy and not in the economy of grace. In the economy of grace, God really, what He does is He restores you as a person and he restores you materialistically that's what Christ does so so that I want to add and let's read I want to read yeah this was also interesting to me like in in, in Ephesians 3 verse 1 where, where Paul says I Paul an apostle of let me just read that scripture to you I know you guys have heard Christ so much. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me for you. Dispensation. So this word dispensation. Why? How do we come to the point where we say dispens that, that we say that there's economy of Christ? That we even call it the economy of Christ. So we're looking at this word dispensation where it says in Greek, oikonomia, where it means household, the management of household goods. So, where do we draw the connection where this is an economy? Where? I'm asking you guys, you guys must speak to me. I'm just playing. <laughs> so, 
So then I went to I went to my old friend, which is not really advisable, but I went to my old friend, Mr. Google, and Mr. Google confirms it to me. So on Google, the word economy is also more or less the same word in French and also traced back to Greek, where it is oikos, it's two words, oikos, nemin. What's that word? Oikos, ne, 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 it's oikos, nemain. So oikos meaning house and the main meaning manage. And where it's put together, it's oikonomia, where it says household management. So, but this is the English dictionary. This is not from the scriptures. This is the English, where in the end, it simply means management of material resources. And this dates back to the 15th century. So this is way back, where the origin of this word economy. So now, by what I'm telling you here, and by what I'm reading in the scriptures, now this brings the connection that me saying dispensation, that the dispensation of the grace of God in that scripture means simply the economy of the grace of God has been given to me for you. So, but I'm adding this as well to say that the saints carry a multitude of grace. And this economy cannot thrive without the saints. Everybody is a saint. But everybody, but there's different function. There's only the, the function that differs. And not to say that the one person is more important, but the function of the person is important. Like in a company, you have a manager, you have an operations supervisor, and you have the cleaner, the admin lady, and so forth. But not to say that your boss is, is excluded from being, from being able to, to, to be fired, but his function and responsibility is important to what he must adhere to in the or that, that he was that he must do in the company. So, in the context of the church and the body of Christ, is that you have saint ones, angels, angelos, that their, their functions differ from the function of a saint or a pastor or a evangelist and and so forth, prophet and so. So, and usually saint ones is referred to, or not referred to in, in context of the scripture, a saint one is either mostly a prophet or an apostle. But in a more broader spectrum, it's an elder or a father. It's, it's how they... So, but, and then I went to do my research, like Monamos had the word from the Holy Spirit that said, um, you must follow the way I read the word or I do. And then, because I haven't done this in a while, I thought I was doing it. And then, boop, this thing popped up where I, let me just put off this data. This thing popped up where I, I found another scripture and I couldn't believe my eyes. So I'm going to read the whole context to you. If that is okay with all of you. But, in this Ephesians chapter 1, the same word, let me make an example be, before I explain that. Like in a pharmacy now, when you, like the pharmacist, what does the pharmacist do with all the, the medication? The pharmacist dispenses, it's called dispensing. So, and how do you, how, how does it come to the pharmacist dispensing the medication to you? There must be a prescription from a doctor that this is what I need. And so you bring the prescription and the pharmacist dispenses that to you. So that's also a, a, a picture. So like a dispenser at a pharmacy that releases your medication only by your prescription according to what the doctor saw that you have need of and released it at the right time. So Paul also needed to release grace to the church at the right time for the right task and mandate. So when a saint one is sent to the churches, therefore, let's say, when Tamu came to Office Bay, he didn't come and teach on um, no healing. He came because by the, through the Lord and the Holy Spirit, he knew what was, what's the grace that was needed for Office Bay. For, let's say for Namibia, but Walfish Bay specifically. So he knew what was needed to preach to this church here. 
He didn't come with, with antibiotics if we needed uh, Corenza or uh, my fellow's favorite, uh, tensile pain. <laughs> so, so, he didn't come with it. He came to what was prescribed to. Therefore, let's say, us being submitted to, to, to JP, or you guys being submitted here, you won't, what you need is prescribed by God for you. Therefore, God brings you to a house that has the right prescription in the right time needed for you. If, if you go now to St. and you go sit in, sit in Thomas Church, that word will just be flowing above your head. Not because you don't understand. It's not what you need. It's not what God has prescribed for you to have at that, at, in this or at that moment of time. So, in, so my example of, of, of a dispenser in the pharmacy, the word that is being put, like grace at this moment, the economy of grace and grace is the word. It's exactly what we need right now in this time. It's exactly what we need. Because where are we? We are in a pandemic. It's COVID-19. The economy of the world is busy falling. So God is saying, hey, guys, don't worry about that economy. I had my own economy that has been formed from the, from the, from the time I formed the foundations of the earth. I, this economy has been established. And I'm telling you now that here is this economy. Take heed. There he is, this economy. And now he's telling us, how, how can we? That's how we did it. So that is just a historical lesson before I continue to read. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Jesus Christ, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children, which in Greek means sons, so unto the adoption of sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of the good pleasure of his will. No? So you see his will is there included. To the praise of the glorious glory of his grace. To the praise, hallelujah, of the glory. Remember, what does grace bring? Jesus was full of grace and truth. And we beheld his glory. So to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself. That in the dispensation, same Greek word, oikonomia, meaning household goods, that in the economy of the fullness of times he might gather together in all things in Christ, in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of whom he works all things after the counsel of his own will. I'm stopping right there. But I'm just affirming to you to tell you that what I said last week about the inheritance, your erf porsi, that's a executeer. So I'm just confirming in this scripture that in the same context where God is talking about the dispensation, the grace, the economy, in the same context, he's, he's talking about your inheritance. So this is just connecting the dots for you, telling you that what I'm saying in Ephesians 3 about the economy, and then Paul, that the economy of grace is in a saint one, that in this context of scripture, is just confirming to say that this is an economy, and this is a, there is an inheritance, and then it goes to chapter 2, and then to chapter 3, where in chapter 3 it says that, I am, that, there's a, that there's people that possesses 
the grace in relation to your economy, to your inheritance. So you see how God, when, he, when, this, when the epistles were written, it was line upon line. It's like a storybook. So, but in verse, in verse 7, it speaks about the riches of His grace. In verse 9, it says, Having made known unto us the mystery of His will. So this is saying that, God is saying that the economy also relates to His will. Also relate to His purpose. And you see, for us, you, you know what, what, the, what the most challenging thing is? Is that what we love how our lives are orchestrated day to day. You, you have to go to work and you pursuing what you want to do. And there's so much stuff going on that is macro. And so now when God comes and He speaks, when there's so much things that, go on that is micro, and now when God comes and speaks macro, it, it's such a weight. It's such a weight. Yo, how will I, how will I pursue the will of God? Sure, it is hard. It sounds like hard work. But God says, I give you power to do this. So the worry is not in how will you do it. The worry should be, Father, help me to understand this. Help me to grasp this. Because the moment I grasp it, you will empower me. And without having to work, grace will work for me and around me, and in me. Grace will restore me. Grace will heal me. Grace will bring prosperity. Grace will, be, will bring fruitfulness in my life. Grace will direct me. Grace will move me. That's grace. And I'm, no, I'm not overselling grace to you. This is the truth. I'm not a salesman here trying to pitch my product and telling you the beautiful stories of this product to say that if you use this product, young, die, uh, what is it? Malt, uh, 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 no, um, Andy Andy. Like, Andy Andy is most a brand, but it's most a multi purpose disinfectant. So, people use Andy Andy for everything. Uh, the floor of what has the Andy Andy. The fensters. The skull hood. Okay, some was American is a clear with Andy Andy. <laughs> so, but Andy Andy is not grace. I'm telling you about grace. But the world is just overselling Andy Andy. And I'm telling you the truth. Grace is much more than that. So I know that's just the joke I'm making. So bear with me. And let me, yeah, let me go further. In verse 11, I read verse 11 to you, yeah. In verse 12, it says that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted after that after that, you've heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So the word of truth, which is the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. Did you know that this word, in Ephesians 1 verse 14 that says, which is the earnest of our inheritance. Did you know that that word earnest simply means deposit? Simply means down payment. So let me ask you all a question here. Let's dialogue. Do you have the Holy Spirit? So if you have the Holy Spirit, you have a 10% deposit. Or how much some companies demand 50%, 20%. So you have a deposit. So if God gave you the deposit, if if, if you have a job, yeah, or in my instances, like when I do jobs, some, either the company gives me a purchase order, which is the same like a deposit, or they give me a deposit. So if the company invested a deposit into paying me a deposit for the delivery of the video, then they have no choice. They have to pay the rest. Or they have to, they can't say, no, we don't want the video anymore, what, what. You lose your deposit, my friend. So you don't want to lose out. So God gave you a deposit to tell you that there's, there's more that's coming to you. There's the fullness of your inheritance that is on its way to you. That's why He gave you that. But the reason He gave you the deposit of the Holy Spirit, so that the Holy Spirit can help you to understand and perceive this 
economy and this set way of how God is about to bring his inheritance to you. Yo. That's why he gave you the Holy Spirit. That's why he gave you that deposit. It's, 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 an assure, it, it's your insurance, man. I'm to say. So when, your, when, when my parents died, my ID, oh, my friend, is the most important thing for me. Because with, without it, I can not have poor sin. I can not die. How was it? That's a part of that. You know what we did? <laughs> what we did with our first, when we received the pension money, I always wanted a car. Yo. When we started dating, I always wanted our own car to go where we wanted to. So what was the first thing I bought with the pension money? <laughs> okay. But for the sake of, of we, this is, because I'm speaking truth, and my wife mentioned truth, that was not the wisest decision. That was not. Everybody told me, my grandmother told me, just buy a cheaper car and use the money for what? So, but in that time, I had so much, you know, what's the word, challenges with my identity. I needed material things to help me to feel more secure and affirm myself. So I wanted a specific car. Because if I have that car, then I have the reputation. I wanted the reputation. Now glory also means reputation. So I was searching af after the world's reputation. I wanted... Let me, let me be honest with you. I bought that car because I felt if I have that car amongst the coloreds and the whites, I would be recognized. It's like a sin word. Yeah? But you know, at that time, that's not how I thought. And only now, according to the word, now understanding the word, now I understood the mistakes that I made. So God is not, God, I will bless you only. He's gentle with you. He, he, through time, he explains things to you in a gentle way that you understand, oh, this is the mistakes that I've made. This is, uh, so if somebody comes, yo, smile, that's not God. That's not the fruits of the Spirit. That's not God. God is just gentle. The way he comes. Sometimes when JP preached to the word name, then when we, when we chat and we fellowship, and I come say, Iman Miskin, yo, did you hear JP rebuked us? For 10 years, I did not recognize a rebuke in every teaching that, that, that JP had. Because for me, it was just, it just felt, God is just gently telling me, this is what you must do. Okay, I see, I, made, I did this wrong, you must, you must do this right. It never felt like a rebuke, although other people recognize the rebuke. I never recognized the rebuke. So, let me not get off topic, but I just wanted to explain that deposit, that, the, that God gave you a deposit, the Holy Spirit. And even you, Caitlin, you have a deposit of the Holy Spirit, and you have an inheritance in Christ. So, you don't have to, let's say in life, when I finished school, this picture was, I didn't study, so I must work hard. It's going to take me about how many years, five to ten years, to get to a place where I own my own house, business, cars, and what, what, what. That was, so, this grace is not that 10 year plan that I had. This grace is not even a 5 year plan. This grace is that the plan is dependent on you. That's the good news. You determine how long you will take to access your inheritance. You determine. You determine how long you will struggle financially. You determine how long you will, you will, you will struggle emotionally. Let's say that. You, this grace word you are the one that god gave you in adam god gave you the power and the authority over the fish of the sea over every creeping thing upon the earth and in christ in that seated position he gave you authority over the heavens and the earth god gave you that authority so now with this word you have the authority to determine how long you will remain in that place where you are God gave the church to be the head over the things. Therefore, we need grace that will empower us to fulfill and complete the will of God. So, I'm talking, I'm, what I'm doing here, I'm, I'm speaking macro, micro. 
macro, micro. So I'm speaking, this is what God says macro, then I'm narrowing it down to micro. So I'm, I'm trying to bring what the word is saying in a macro sense, bring it down to micro, how it relates to us individually. And in relation to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 9, which says, what does verse 9 say? Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. Yeah. Okay. Moving on, we have to know how to receive grace. In how to partake, how to access, how to engage, how to increase it to you. What does grace do? It changes you, it transforms you. So it's important that we know, really know. In because the thought just came now to me where I'm thinking. Sometimes when, when, when I'm listening to, to JP's word, like in the past when we were in Wolfish Bay, I would sometimes ask him things. And so when I, when I would ask him, JP, now how do we access Christ? Then he would go to the scriptures and, and, and share with me. And then I, but I have a thought, like, uh, like a physical thing, like, okay, no, maybe my question would be, maybe my question in my heart would be, now, should I give more money to access more grace? Maybe that I'm making an example. That's, that's my question. Now I'm asking JP, now how do we access? But why not just ask him how, the, how it's in my, what I'm thinking, so that he can answer me more directly. So then I'm asking, okay, JP, how should I give more money? Then he would, then he would explain to me in such a way that it's more neutral to say that he's not telling me to give more money. He's not telling me to give less money. He's trying to help me understand so that I can make a much better decision, a much a better decision according to by revelation. Okay. Then I heard him, okay, that's what you're saying. But I'm still not sure. Okay, JP. Now what would you do if this was your scenario? So I, I then I then I paint him a scenario. I'm telling what what would you do? And then when he says, no, I would have done this and this and this. And I say, okay, thank you. That's that's all that I'm gonna do. Because I the reason why I, I started doing that, it's because I can more see the fruit in this person's life. I can more see the fruit of his decisions, the fruit of how he's accessing grace, the fruit in his relationship to his, first, to his spiritual father, the fruit in his practice of this economy. I saw the fruit. So why would I want? Yeah, I need understanding. But now that I have understood, I'm still unsure in practice. And I just ask the person, who do you like? What would you do? Because the main thing is, while I'm teaching this, is that do you understand in practice what you should do to access grace? That is the most important part, is that you must understand in practice. Because maybe even, it might be that you might, it might be difficult to do, but at least you know what to do, you see. So not everything, the word is, is a place where it's in contrary to the world's perspective. So it might not be the easiest thing to do, but it's the right thing to do. It's the righteous thing to do. So that's actually the difference between where we, where we might feel that something is difficult to do. For, say for instance, where with us, when we were in, in lockdown, we were struggling and like our struggle was really, really different. We didn't lack. There were days like here and there, but sparingly where we lacked maybe a meal or so, but rarely. My wife made a plan. She just had this, has this grace where she would make mask or make something, and so we didn't lack. But just with paying um, certain accounts and the rent and stuff, they so we struggled a lot. And in that place, so it's so it's not easy knowing that you must pay ten thousand dollars and you have two thousand. And you're about to give that 2,000, you're about to, to, to give it unto the Lord. Although we give it physically unto a person, but in the spirit and by revelation, we're giving it unto the Lord. So you, you're about to give two, 3,000 to, to the Lord, where you actually need 10. So rather, why not keep the three and try and make a plan for the rest? Then you have the 10 and then you're safe. But... It just came to a point where you have to understand that what do you value? So in Matthew chapter 21, it speaks about where the heart is. So 
Is your heart more concerned with your personal needs or is your heart more concerned with the world? What is right in the sight of God? What is right? Are you, that is the will of the will of God is pursuing what is right in the sight of God. So that is the challenge. So, so in saying that, yo, I'm about to give 3,000 now for as an offering where I actually need 10. So giving the three takes me back to zero and yo, and uh, maybe I might be evicted with my family looking for a new place. Where am I going? Am, am I going to go stay by Mona for a while? Who can I mark? So you, but we were willing. Like Jesus was like a like a lamb, a willing lamb being led to the slaughter to be sacrificed. We were willing to go through those challenges because we saw by revelation and by faith. Through, through the word that, that was preached to us, we saw that giving that offering has much more value to what, to, to, I'm not saying take your money, give it away, and money wire from the land, right? I'm not saying that. I want you just to hear to, my, to our testimony so that you can receive understanding and grace to know how you should go about your things. So by doing that, we... We definitely, so when we gave the money, nah, things didn't shift immediately. <laughs> that is the, that's the news. So things didn't shift and you might feel like, yo, did I do the right thing? Yo, did I hear right by the Lord? <laughs> Those are the first questions. But when you go to, in, in Hebrews 5 verse 8 where, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. That wasn't an instance of, I'm sowing something, eh, I'm going to reap. God was teaching us there that through our sufferings there, he was teaching us obedience. That in spite of what's happening around you, are you willing to do the right thing? Are you willing to pursue righteousness? Are you willing to pursue my kingdom? That was the challenge. The challenge was, the, the lesson was obedience rather than sowing and reaping, rather than giving and getting. Because if you give, you will get. Don't make a mistake. And don't tell yourself that, no, if I give this, if I give my time or my money or I bless somebody or I pray for somebody, if I do that, that no, I don't want anything. I'm just doing unto the Lord. No. There's a fine line that in not wanting, because you can say to yourself, no, Smiley says, no, I'm giving this and I don't expect anything in return. No, no, you must expect something. Don't, don't fool yourself. You must. But your expectation should not be from man, but from the Lord. Because the one scripture says, that which you do in secret, the Lord shall reward you publicly. So, what you do, you do it unto the Lord. So when you gave, expect, be pregnant with the Lord, must do something. Be, because that's your faith right there. That is your faith. That is your hope. To know that the Lord shall do it for me. So you must, we must take away the, the, the veil, if I can use that word, the veil to say that I'm giving unto a person. Or let's say, um, let's say in a relationship with me and my wife that I'm praying for her or I'm giving her a word. And remember, in, in marriage, it's not easy. <laughs> not easy, my friend. It's, it's, cha it's challenging. It's, it's, because you have this beautiful woman. Yeah, but I won't. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. Those are past experiences. And my wife would also say, yo, I have this handsome man, but yo, that attitude, oh, yo, it's a problem. But in spite of all that, you have to do the right thing. You have to pursue righteousness. You have to give yourself to that person. So in the same manner, but you're not giving yourself to the person. You are just adhering to the word. 
to the righteous word. So in the same way when we're giving unto saint ones, unto the Lord, it's not the person that you, it's just, that person is just taking possession of what we give. But it's unto the Lord that you are doing it. And now you are expected. So the Lord says, He rewards you, He gives things unto you. But now, now yes, remember, remember I mentioned the, the dent, um, at the, not dentist, at the pharmacy, where, where they dispense your medication, where you come with a prescription. So there's a prescribed way that you will receive from the Lord. And so the Lord is saying that there's an economy. This is my prescribed way that I will bring you to the things, your inheritance that I have for you. And um, there's just no other way. There's no other way. What we've known in previous seasons, this is the new season. I'm not declaring now, but we've been in how many years we've, we're in a new season. And this is the prescribed way. There's no other way. So, you have to sell the knowledge of an old season to enter into a new one. And in Genesis 12, I'm not going to read this, but it's the story of Abram, where Abram had to, for Abram to journey, there were some things that they had to leave behind. So he couldn't take everything. That guy had property and land and cattle and what. But obviously if he was to move his whole, what everything that he possessed to a new place, promised to, 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 to the promised land. Now he has to leave something behind. So he had to leave behind an old thinking, things, everything to journey to this new position that the Lord was taking him to. So that's the, that's the challenge that, that, that we go through. And last thing that I want to add is um, in Matthew, I want to read to you Matthew 19 verse 20. Verse 20, it says, I'm going to read from... So yeah, from verse 16, 19 verse 16. It says, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why call you me good? There is no one good but one that is God. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man says unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I? So it's, it's, it's in the context of, you know, you grew up in a Christian home. And so like an example that I, that, that, that I now make a lot recently is that, is that I'm saying that if you look at the scriptures, you would say, to be a, what is, the, what, what is the, the practice or the cost to be a believer? It, you must believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior and He died for you and got risen up unto heaven and you are now seated with him in heavenly places. That is by believing that you become a believer. You become, you get, you enter into the family of God, you and then you get baptized and then you are a son of God and all these things. So if you do not believe that, then you are not a believer, you are not a saint. So in the context of the Pharisees, né, going back, in the context of the, of the Pharisees, is that the Pharisees did not receive Jesus Christ. Now, were the Pharisees practicing the, the biblical things? Yeah, they were practicing the law of Moses and things like that. Were, was there a temple? Yes, they were in the temple practicing things. But the Pharisees struggled to receive Jesus Christ and to believe that Jesus Christ was their Lord and Savior. So in context of this young man that says, Jong, ek het mos al hierdie goede gepraktis wat jy nou sê, um, honor your mother and your father, what, 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 and al die goede, and so, wat lek ek dan? The rich young man says. Now Jesus says unto him, if you will be, if you will be perfect, go and sell what you have and give to the poor and you have 
and you shall have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. So, he's, so, so but to make an example, it's not always that you must physically sell je vat nou jou hele huis en jou navarra en jou wat en jy gaan geen over die kerk en te sê, jy so, paste, ek verkoop alles van ek soek hierdie heavenly treasures. No, 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 no. The scripture is interpreted, must be interpreted by revelation. So, you're not literally, literally practicing that. But in the story, it was literal. But in the, now, in, now that we're reading the scripture, by the spirit, it's by revelation. So this might be that the Lord might request different things from, from, from everyone. Might request, say, thy um, data, die bezigheid van jou, um, gee hom vir die Heere. Nou sê jy, ja, now I'm going to stop with this business now. I'm giving it unto Lord JP, here's all my data things, here's all my clientele and stuff, this is yours. Um, Wat moet JP nou maak met dit? JP is a pastor. What, what must he do with it now? What must the Lord do now with, with that? No. It's simply saying that that which you're doing in the manner which you do it, now you're saying, when I give my business unto the Lord, I'm now saying, Father, you teach me how I should conduct this business so that this business may be a representation of you and not of myself. That's how you give it unto the Lord. So this is me just giving you a practical example. So let me continue reading the story quickly. And then Jesus said unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall not shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. So it's just in that context that is what he's saying that to buy grace and to sell grace that oh sorry to buy and sell you sell what you have in order to buy so you selling what you have is not just giving it away or giving it to the person that is that is now called that is now sent to you with the dispensation of the grace of god that is not what it's saying it's simply saying that what you possess in your heart it must, it must have its place. You see? Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. So, our, so let's say an example, again, Jelly, of myself, <laughs> is that my wife, I go buy a van die, for van me, by Liva, and my family, and what we have, I value. I, I value our businesses because it's the first time in my life that where I'm doing something and people are just loving what I, people respect you. So if I have, if I had, have or had an identity crisis, then yo, then I would, then that would be my, my, my golden calf right there. That, 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 that would be my idol. So I would do everything and anything for that business to make sure that I can get more and more praise. But I have to, that business you give unto the Lord, where He's the one guiding me and helping me to, to almost like to, to build it righteously so that that business can have its rightful place in my heart. Where the Lord takes first priority, then my family, then my wife, then my kids, then the ministry, then the business. So there must be it, things must be prioritized in, in your heart. So, so sometimes in buying and selling grace, it's simply putting the thing in its rightful place. Putting the things which you go through. Sometimes our hurt yeah, is also priority. We would say, nee, ek hou nie van tussen klom mense weesie van, ek hou net van soos een klein groepies en praat en so. That's your hurt. That, that is just you saying that you making your hurt, you, your hurt is taking priority in your life. And so where the righteousness comes in, where the right way of God comes in, where it says you must be connected to a family. You must be connected to a household of grace. It's the way God has put it out for you. But you say, no, um, you actually not willing to accept that past experiences 
has made you in such a way that you say, nee, ek is beter in klinger groepies. So that hurt is taking opposition to the will of God. So, so I'm just throwing out examples. You, as, as you listen to the word further, you will, you in your own heart and in your own mind will have your own thoughts and examples of maybe where, where there are places where you have placed a, a higher priority above God. And even for us, for me as well, listening to, to this word and pursuing this word, God must still instruct us in places and because sometimes we don't, we're not aware of everything that, that's in our heart. And the Holy Spirit is the one that helps us to reach into that subconscious in our minds and in our hearts where these are the things, like, like with my wife, where she had the dream or the word about the color pink. She didn't know there was a problem with the color. But then the Lord spoke to her and then it was difficult, but she was willing to make way with that so that in, so that in the end she could what? Journey further in a journey with the Lord. So there's, there's, that's, where you, that's where we say, like in last week, I made an example of the tabernacle, an altar, sorry. That's where we build an altar, where we sacrifice something. So in the Old Testament, they had to put down altars to make sacrifices to, to, to further journey. So we also make altars in our lives where we sacrifice certain things, our businesses and stuff like that. And I'll explain to you, you can go to Katie for Katie and for Jelly and for Rose, and you can go to the house and you can say, so, um, um, I'm giving the children unto the Lord. No, <laughs> it's in your heart. It's simply in your heart. <laughs> so, 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 yeah. So, this is actually liberating. Where people are walking around with this, this distorted paradigm of thinking that um, the church wants your things, it wants your business and your money and your cars. The third, the church has no need of what God. If God created the earth. Hy nodig jou geld die. Wat maak jy met jou geld? How? No. It's simply because money is a, is, is a very valuable commodity in the world system. And that's where we come from when we transition from the world into the family of God. So then obviously, in a lot of people's hearts, money takes priority. So therefore God asks for your money. That's the only reason he asked for money. If it was meat, then he would say, I want your meat. And if it was whatever, he would just tell you that that's what he wants. So the only reason why God is saying that we must give tithes and offerings and first fruits. If you own a farm, sorry, if you own a farm and you have in your bank account $2,000, but you have 100 cattle, what will be your tithe? Will you be tithing of the 2,000 in your account or be tithing from your cattle? That's a good question. That's a, that's a very good question. See, because what is happening with, with, with the cattle? It's most reproducing the whole time. So it's something, that it's, it's, it's something that's flowing. So in, so in everything that's flowing, so it's increasing and increasing. So there's you selling and you're getting more. You're selling and you're getting more. So you, you will be paying tithe maybe from your money and your cattle. Everything that we possess, we give a tenth of to the Lord. So it's not to say that God needs what we possess. It's simply Him helping us to put whatever we possess in its right place. So that is freeing us to say when we give tithe, offerings and stuff, that we are giving it by, it's by law. And we should never give by law. Because somebody else expects that we should do it. We should never do that. The moment you do that, you are just giving money away, my friend. No, don't expect anything from the Lord. But if you give it by grace, because the scripture says, He who gives cheerfully. If you give it by grace and by spirit and by the spirit, there's a reward for your giving. Not because out of necessity, that the church needs it or that who or the Lord needs it. It's simply because 
it's to put the Lord in its rightful place in your heart. So in that context, that is how we trade, that's how we buy, sell Christ. That's how we trade for Christ. We sell what we have. But yeah, Matthew 6 verse 21. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust does corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up treasures, lay for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust does corrupt. Oh, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye be single, the whole body shall be full of light. But if your eye be evil, your whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in the darkness, how great is the darkness. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and Mammon. So look in the same context where it speaks about where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. In the same context, it speaks about God and Mammon. So God is a, a way that money carries a vital uh, part in our value system. God is aware of that. So don't expect like, Nee, die Heere is gee so, hy is nie much betrokke met die vies. Nee, he is well away, because he, is, he lives in eternity, and we live in time. So God knows the end from the beginning. He knows the beginning from the end. So he knew that money would play a vital part in our, in our value system. That's why he's, he's constantly talking about money. And that's why we give tithes and stuff like that. But not by law, as I said, but by, by the Spirit by faith. You must give by faith. And when I say when you give by faith, it's simply saying that um, I have revelation and understanding of what tithes is, what first fruits is, what giving is, and when, when because of that revelation, therefore I give. So when you give without revelation, you are just, you are just practicing the law which will bear no fruit in your life. It must be by revelation. We gave tithe. There was a time where I think it was in 20, 2014, 2015. Yeah, let me say 2015, 2016. My giving was 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 definitely lawful because I remembered when I 2011 when I got the job. When I got that new job, when the Lord blessed me with a three time increase, yo, I was just prospering financially, and there was a lot of faith in my heart. But as I increased, somehow the things got hold of my heart. And so when we moved out of my mother's house 2015 into a flat where we were supposed to pay now more for rent and I had much less of my salary, it was a struggle. And then I tithed, but I would tithe maybe four months and then skip a month or two and then tithe three months and then skip a month or two. So it was, so by that pattern I could, I could now realize our years afterwards, that it was more by law that I did it. And so, and even in that time, I thought, if you miss a month, <laughs> so if you're three months behind, like, yo, who can I come for time, yo? And so the one time when I spoke to JP, he liberated me and he told me, no, it's by faith that, that, that you do it. The Lord does, does all the right up. So if you miss, if you, if, if, Let's say if you, it, 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 it's, if it's something that you're struggling with, when you just come to the point where you repent, and you say, Father, this is what, I've, this, this is what I'm struggling with. Right? And the Lord teaches you and shares with you, and He helps to, to, to build your faith, and you now tithe and stuff by faith, then, Jy die ouskild om op te kom nie, begin om weer fars niet. Because that's, that, that is what happened to us. And one thing that I like, it's actually a nice phrase, is that your treasure illuminates your heart. That's the, that's the thing. So we will see by just the way you live will determine where your heart is. But it's not for us to judge. It's the Lord that judges. It's the Word that judges. 
But the word does not judge to condemn, but it judges to set you free, to liberate you.